Do you think God would forgive a pedophile? That's about the worst sin that I can imagine. Is there more than forgiveness? And is anybody too bad for God? That's the topic today, but before I speak about it, would you please welcome my wife, Beverly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. From time to time, I get prayer requests and questions about anger, like this one from Diana. I have been married for about six months, and on our wedding day, my husband and I promised each other that we would never go to bed angry. Something has happened because I haven't slept for a week. Well, Diana, you're not the first and you won't be the last. In the short time that I have, let's deal with the basics. There are several levels of anger. First level is the quick anger that arises when someone cuts in front of us on the freeway, or perhaps pushes in front of us in line at the supermarket, or we're at the mall in our car and we're waiting for a parking spot. We see this car backing out and all of a sudden this other car zooms in front of us. Oh, what do we do? Get head up. Well, as we mature and grow up, we let it go because we realized these things are just the small stuff compared to the bigger trials and stresses of life. This brings us to the second level. Someone steals our car. Someone steals our identity. Someone burns our house down. And we get angry, and rightfully so. We need to hand that over to the law and do whatever else we need to do, but then move on with God's help. The next level gets more personal. Children and youth who are being attacked by angry bullies at school. We need to teach our children to never keep silent about these things, but to tell both their teachers and their parents. The next level of anger is not a pretty one. While we all can get angry at times, either at our own sinfulness or the sinfulness of others, there is no excuse for constant anger. There is a very insidious lie going around that says, well, we can speak and act badly as we like and then just say, oh, I'm sorry. But the Bible says to those that live that way, repent before it's too late. Sometimes we need to be assertive, but not in a manipulative way. Some are quick to pick fights. They use verbal abuse to get their own way, but this is not the way of the Christian. When husbands and wives, or children and parents, or people in the workplace, wherever, when we have a disagreement, let's still show the other person respect. We may not agree with what they're saying or how they're saying it, but we can show their person respect. As the Bible says, we are to treat others as we want them to treat us. Proverbs 29, an angry man stirs up dissension, or a woman, and a hot-tempered one commits many sins. But Proverbs 16 says, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. And as we look at those two photos, I'm sure we all know which family we want to have. When we find ourselves angry, or we're facing others that are angry, what do we do? Many books have been written on this subject. Some of them give good advice, but for the Christian, there is one main and chief book, the Bible. If we're a Christian, the Bible teaches us not to act or react in like manner. If we believe we are right, let's stand our ground, but with grace and dignity. If we have been wrongfully accused and put down, the Bible says, don't seek revenge, for vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. We are to forgive whether the person asks for it or not. We remember the Lord's prayer, 
Forgive me for my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. Forgiving doesn't mean we become a doormat, but by releasing our anger and bitterness, we are allowing the Holy Spirit to heal us. When God looks at our sinfulness, he also looks at us with compassion. Psalm 103 says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. When we yield our lives to his loving heart, he isn't angry with us. Instead, he welcomes us with open arms and with great joy and great delight. The topic today is why there is more than forgiveness. Will God forgive a murderer, a pedophile? Can you think of anything worse than that? Is the grace of God sufficient for all types of sins? And if so, is there more than forgiveness? The law is tough. The law doesn't save a person. People say, well, you know, the law has got grace in it. No, there's not a drop of grace in the law. Uh, the lawgiver, that's, an, that's another question. But the law is there for a purpose. And I want you to meet today a special police officer. Would you please welcome Officer Dane. Just a moment. If anybody's got a cell phone on here today, you know what's going to happen to you, don't you? Hmm. Officer Dane, we're glad to have you here today. Why from, and of course, we're just kidding a bit of this, from the LAPD. Now, folks watching in Australia, you haven't got a clue what that means. I guess the LAPD, the Los Angeles Police Department. Now, officer... What's your main job? To uh, instill order and to uphold the law. Is that really needed in this great city of the angels? Uh, I would say so, yes. Why is the law so important? Um, because if there was no law, there'd be a lot of havoc going around. Just like uh, um, a time I can remember is the LA riots. <clears throat> when... Um, there was, we had all our men out on, on, in, the, in the field, and there was just a lot of looting, um, people going, breaking into houses, stores, uh, setting fires. There was uh, quite a few murders, so. So we need the law. Definitely. Definitely. And if there's no law, what's gonna happen to Los Angeles? What's going to happen to this great land of the United States? Well, it's gonna go down fast, yes. And what's, Describe America without the law. Well, I mean, you can see some of those other countries in uh, like the Middle East. There, uh, there's um, people going around bombing uh, places. There's uh, all kinds of crazy things going on. I want to say, and we want to say this to the television audience, we believe as Christian citizens in upholding the law. And we thank God for our police force and especially for policemen like you, Steve. Thank you. And God bless you, Steve. Thank you for coming today. <laughs> and you folks all know, Steve was doing a little bit of acting there, wasn't he? Yes. You all know who he was, don't you? Yeah. But didn't he look good? Amen. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, remember, I remember telling you folks some time back now, you know, time gets by. This must have been five or six years ago when Beverly and I had been up to see the girls in San Francisco. We were driving back and uh, we were in a speed limit of 70 miles an hour. And so I had the car just stuck in 70 miles an hour. Remember the story? A guy went past riding a motorbike. I'd never seen anything like it before. Because he went past so fast, I could hardly see him. And when he went past, he stood up. 
actually stood up and then he put his arms out like this. Now, I, um, I was like the man in the Bible who turned aside to see that great sight. And so I said, I'm going to catch up to him, see what he's doing. <laughs> but he, he was going down the road, I guess, 110, maybe 120 miles an hour, standing up in the stirrups with his hands out like this. <laughs> and so I was catching up on him, but he turned off and I slowed down. But as I was slowing down, a police car was coming from the other direction but there was this thing between the two of us. I thought, ha <laughs> And so I slowed down and I was back to 70 and uh, I heard the noise. This big car pulled up behind me and put his lights on, but there was a semi-trailer next to me and he pulled straight off the road because he thought the policeman was after him. <laughs> but the semi-trailer pulled off the road but the cop went, uh, went straight out round. Didn't stop the semi-trailer and pull me up. And when uh, he pulled me up, he um, put down my window. I said, uh, good morning, officer. Nice day. He said, yes. <laughs> he said, do you know how fast you were going? I said, how fast do you think I was going? <laughs> now, I shouldn't tell you, folks. I don't do this, folks, except when I'm provoked. He, I gave him the figure, which was the figure he gave me, actually. And I, I said, I, I'm relieved. He said, you're relieved to be caught? I said, no, I'm relieved that I was slowing down. He said, you were slowing down? He said, how fast had you been going? I said, just between friends. So I gave him this three-digit figure. He said, what, why were you doing this? I said, uh, Beverly said, uh, she said, plead temporary insanity. You know, she was talking all the time. I said, for goodness sake, be quiet. Don't say any more. She said, officer, I told him he ought to keep the law. That's what she said. I told him he shouldn't have been speeding. I said, officer, I'm completely guilty. But I saw a motorbike go past me and the man was standing up and he was waving like a bird. The policeman said, you saw that? He said, I saw it too. He said, what do you think he was doing? I said, that's the very thing I was trying to find out. <laughs> it's true. I said, I was trying to catch him to see how he could do this. The policeman said, I've never seen anything like it. He said, um, um, had the book out. He said, um, what do you do? Oh, <laughs> I said, it's better for you not to know. He said, where do you live? I said, Thousand Oaks. He said, uh, what have you been doing? I said, we've been seeing our daughters. Uh, he said, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, one of the tenets of our faith is that we tell people to keep the law. Mm. He said, you uh, sort of weren't very successful today, were you? I said, no, but... You know, I saw this great... He said, I did too. So we talked about this guy on the motorbike again for a little bit. Then he put the book down. He said, I guess everybody needs a break. He said, everybody needs a break. He said, even including you. And he said, just be careful. Don't go fast because there are lots of my brethren down the road. <laughs> and I said, that's it? He said, yeah. You have a nice day. So I said, God bless you. <laughs> now listen, folks, there's such a thing as grace. But the law can't show you grace. Only the person in charge of the law. But the law cannot change. And the law does not show you mercy. And the law demands its pound of flesh. Listen, when you break the law, you've got to pay. There's always the penalty. Now we're talking not about man's law. You know, state of California can say it's 70 or 65 or 55. Man can forgive easily that. But the law of God cannot be changed. 
and it cannot be bent just because some, some guy is riding a motorbike and you've gone out to see the sight. I want you to come over here to Romans chapter 2 and verse 12 in the Holy Scriptures. Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. The Apostle Paul says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. Whether you know the law or not, it makes no difference. Because the law is eternal, whether you know about it or not. That's concerning God's law. Come over here to chapter 7 and verse 12. Paul cries out, So then, the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous and good. Therefore, I want this to sink down into your ears today, and if you don't understand about the law, you can't understand about what Christ did for us. The Bible teaches that the law is binding, eternal, just, unforgiving, and demands its pound of flesh. And the good news of the gospel is this. Now this, you think the law is the gospel? Answer me. Is the law the gospel? The law is not the gospel. People say, well, everything in the Bible is gospel. No, it's not. There is the law and the gospel. But the gospel is different to the law, but it upholds the law. Listen, Jesus paid the full penalty of the law for me. I want you to come now to John chapter 18 and verses 3 to 8. And I want you to look at these texts as you've never looked at them before because I've discovered something wonderful in these verses. John chapter 18, verses 3 and onwards. John, the gospel according to St. John, chapter 18 and verse 3 and onwards. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers. That's like the law coming. And some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees, they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. This is like the law. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Now look at this next verse, because this is sort of amazing. Verse 8. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. And there's the gospel. The law comes with flaming torches and with soldiers. But Jesus steps out and he says, here I am, let these men go. And when the men were allowed to go, he went to the cross to pay the price of a broken law. And so the gospel to me today and the gospel to you is summed up in these amazing words of our Lord these words that I've overlooked for many, many years, when Jesus said, I am he, then let these men go. Because he went to the cross. The Bible tells me he chose not to go with them. He could have gone with them. But instead, they went. They went home. He went to the cross. Let me tell you why the details of the passion of Gethsemane and the cross are a mystery to many, many people. 
even a mystery to many, many Christians. A mystery to people who believe, especially in the moral influence theory. When they read the story of Gethsemane and the story of the cross, it is an incomprehensible mystery because of their theology. Firstly, the sweat of the garden. He's taken the cup. And as he takes the cup, he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood falling to the ground. Why is this? This is surely a mystery. If I was simply drinking some wine or whatever it was, I would not be sweating in agony drops of blood. Would you come over here to Isaiah 51? And this gives us some idea. Isaiah 51 and verse 17, my dear friends. It talks about the cup of the Lord's wrath. Awake, awake, rise up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath. You who have drained to its dregs the goblet that makes men stagger. There is a cup from the Lord. And as the British call it, it is the cup of his wrath. It is the cup of punishment and judgment. And when people drink from this cup, the Bible says they stagger like drunk men. And then if you come over, please, to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 23 in the Holy Scriptures. Ezekiel 23. And look at these verses as though you were reading them for the first time. Ezekiel 23, verse 32 and 33. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. You will drink from your sister's cup, a cup large and deep. It will bring scorn and derision, for it holds so much. You'll be filled with drunkenness and sorrow, the cup of ruin and desolation the cup of your sister Samaria. The Bible talks about the cup of the Lord's wrath. And the Bible says that when this cup is placed into the hand of the sinner, he trembles and he moans and he cries out in anguish and he staggers. That is the cup that Jesus was drinking from. He was drinking of the cup of the Lord's fierce anger because of the broken law. You must remember, and we are inclined to overlook this, when we think of religion today, we usually think not of a young Christ. We think of the Father shown as the Ancient of Days. But Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is a man in his prime, in his 30s. He is suntanned. He has muscles. Bless your heart, he was a carpenter and walking 20 or 30 miles a day was nothing to him because he was in the prime of manhood. And yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, he staggers and he cries and he sweats drops of blood. And then you think of the cry of dereliction on the cross, a mystery to the world, an incomprehensible mystery. When God's own son, the sinless one, hangs on the cross and he, he gasps out to his father, my God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? A person who doesn't understand the mystery of the cross would say, I would like to die like Christ because he was the son of God. The death of Christ is the death of a lost soul who's drunk the cup of the Lord's wrath a strong young man in his prime who cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why? 
because the law demands its pound of flesh. Never forget it. You know the play written by Shakespeare and the man who said, I demand my pound of flesh. That is the law. And then you think of the suddenness of his death. This also is an incomprehensible mystery to those who do not understand the doctrine of the blood atonement. It is a fact that a man or even a woman, because they crucified women also, in the same way, a man or a woman could survive the torments of the cross not for hours, but for days. Suspended between earth and heaven, stark naked before the world, covered in blood. The tormented victim at last would have his or her eyes picked out by the birds. But this would take days of suffering and pain. But this stronger than usual young man, a man in the prime of life in his probably mid-30s, expired in a brief six hours. They nailed him up at nine. He was gone by three. And these mysteries to the world are not mysteries to us who understand uh, the gospel. The Bible tells me he was carrying the curse of the law. Now come over here, please, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and uh, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Paul says, and he died for all. He died for all. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ died for us. And verse 21 says these words. Notice these words. God made him, Christ, who had no sin, to be sin for us, who are full of sin, so that in, in him we might become the righteousness of God. That is what the Bible says. In a way that is incomprehensible to these slow, dull-witted minds, the sin of every person who has ever lived, B.C., A.D., from the beginning of time to the end of time, the sin of all people were laid upon him. And sin is breaking the law of God. And the law shows no mercy. And if you come over here to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, unlike the law of man that can show mercy, the law of God can show no mercy. But the lawgiver can. Galatians 3 verse 13. The Bible says, Christ redeemed us from what? Curse. The curse of the law. By becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Therefore, the mystery of the cross is understood when we appreciate the fact that Christ was carrying the curse of the law. He was being punished for our sins and he was condemned by the law of God. He suffered the penalty so he could say, let these men go. He could not say those words, let these men go. If he did not go, in their place. Let these men go. Forgiveness is described in the Bible in different ways. Today we shall take but two. Forgiveness is described in the Bible firstly by the word justification. 
This is the legal language of the court. This is a forensic term. You've heard of a forensic scientist. The word justification is the term that is used in a court. Come over here to Romans chapter 4, verses 5 to 8. Romans chapter 4 and verses 5 down to 8. However, to the man who does not work, that's for salvation, but trusts God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. This word justification, let me write it up, to justify, justify, it is a forensic legal term. And it talks, it means forgiveness in the sense that God declares. Justify means to declare that the sinner is righteous. He now stands in a different position to the position he stood in before. It is to declare righteous. It does not mean, as Mother Teresa was taught to believe, it does not mean to make righteous. Now, Mother Teresa, we all believe, was a great saint of God. I have preached sermons on her. But more recently, her letters were published in which she said she never enjoyed for one moment the favor of God. Am I here to judge her? Of course not. God is the judge. But often she said she felt that she should become an atheist because she did not see his face. She was taught by the great scholars, the Jesuits, that justification is a process of making righteous. And therefore, she would ask herself every day, have I been made righteous enough to stand in the presence of God? And every day she said, no, I am not good enough. In contrast, there was Martin Luther, also a Roman Catholic. But after Martin Luther read the sacred scriptures, and uh, particularly the book of Romans that I recommend to you. Luther was found kneeling before a crucifix saying, for me, for me. He understood the meaning of the words, let these men go. Because of the blood atonement. And so in the scriptures, you have justification, which brings complete full forgiveness, and it also gives us a restored relationship. Come over here, please, to Luke chapter 15. A restored relationship. Luke chapter 15, I want you to see this with your own eyes. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Without knowing it, they were preaching the gospel. And then you have the story of the prodigal son. Verse 11. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me, give me, give me. It's the cry of the carnal heart. Give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after the younger son got together all he had, set out for a distant country, and you know the story, he squanders it in wild living. And in the end, he is completely destitute without a friend. 
And verse 20, so he got up and went to his father after an awakening. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son makes a speech, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I'm not worthy. And verse 23, but the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. So this verse here is not giving an exegesis of justification. It is talking about what happens when the sinner comes to the father's house. He is completely forgiven and he's restored to the fellowship of the father's house. So when you come back to the father's house, it is as though you'd never been away. And the legal basis is the cross of Christ. Thus the Father can say, let these men go. They are declared righteous and there is room for them at my table in my house. Now, the Bible says there is forgiveness for all who come to themselves and come home. Not just for some. The Calvinists teach this. T-U-L-I-P. This stands for total depravity. And by that they mean that we are depraved in every area of our beings. And of course, they are quite correct. The Calvinists. And there are millions of earnest, godly Calvinists. They also teach the doctrine of unconditional what? Unconditional election. So when you are elected from all eternity, there are no conditions. And God in his infinite wisdom has elected a certain number to be saved and a certain number to burn for all eternity in the fires of hell whether they're good or whether they are bad. Total depravity, unconditional election. And they also teach a doctrine that is, has been believed by millions, and that is a limited atonement. That means that Christ did not die for the whole wide world. Why should he do so when the whole wide world is not going to accept him? He dies only for the elect. Only for a small number. And he uses irresistible, irresistible grace. Once this grace comes to you, you cannot resist it. And therefore, the elect are going to be saved because of his irresistible grace that will give them grace for perseverance. Now, this is a great doctrine that split the Christian church. Total depravity, not all of this is wrong. Unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. It is a profound doctrine believed by millions, but it is wrong. Would you come over here to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verses 5 and 6. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 5 and 6. And here is the text. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for... What does it say? For all men, the testimony given in its proper time. Come now to 1 John, right towards the close of the Bible. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. This is a great text that goes completely against Calvinism. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole wide world. 
And because, my friend, he made a blood sacrifice and a turning sacrifice, not a limited atonement, because he made it for all men, he can turn to all men who come to him and say, let these men go. Let these men go. And because this doctrine is clearly taught in the Bible, there is forgiveness for every kind of sin and every kind of sinner. Think about it. Even Pharisees, even Pharisees, super religious people can be saved. Now that takes a lot of the grace of God. But the man who has been called the most wicked man in all the Bible is Manasseh. Come over here to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. I don't know if he's the most wicked. There, there, there are plenty of wicked men in the Bible. But some say that this was the most wicked man in the Bible. He's certainly up there with the, with the worst. Uh, chapter 32... Verse 33. You got that? Chapter 32, 33. Hezekiah rested with his fathers, was buried on the hill where the tombs of David's descendants are. Now he was one of the best kings. He's a great guy. But his son was one of the biggest scoundrels. All Judah and the people of Jerusalem honored him when he died. And Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. Read on. Manasseh was 12 years old. He reigned in Jerusalem 55 years. Verse 2. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations, the people that the Lord had driven out. Verse 3. He rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah had demolished. He also erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. He bowed down to the starry hosts and worshipped them. He built altars in the temple of the Lord, of which the Lord had said, my name will remain in Jerusalem forever. In both courts of the temple of the Lord, he built altars to all the starry hosts. He sacrificed his sons in the fire in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, practiced sorcery, divination, witchcraft, consulted mediums and spiritists. He sacrificed his own flesh and blood. He was a spiritist. He worshipped the devil. If we had a person like that today in the church, we might be aroused to put him under church censorship. I don't think you'll read anywhere in the Bible a man as bad as Manasseh. Look at verses 10 to 13. Verses 10 to 13. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people. They paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hawk in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. In his distress, he sought the favor of the Lord, his God. But I guess he must have committed the unpardonable sin. After all, those big sins, but it says... He humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. <laughs> Listen, if God can forgive Manasseh, he can forgive you. Can you say amen? amen? If the Lord can just take away the sins of Manasseh, if he can forgive him, he can forgive me. So this is about the worst character I can think of anywhere in history. This man, he was a spiritist. He worshipped the devil. He sacrificed his sons in the fire. He put them to death. He roasted them to death. And when God spoke to him, he said, I don't want to hear from you. And when he turns to God, God forgives him. <laughs> so God can forgive murderers. Say amen. amen. He can forgive adulterers. 
He can forgive pedophiles. Now, let me talk about this. I don't think there's anything worse than that. That's my belief. I don't think there's anything worse than that. I'm not saying that when a pedophile is forgiven, you're not going to be on your guard because only God can read the heart. You can't read the heart. I can't be the heart. And God has also given us a brain. But the Bible tells me God will forgive every sin that is placed upon Christ in repentance. So he'll forgive murderers and adulterers and pedophiles and liars and hypocrites. <laughs> he'll even forgive churchy people. So if you feel hopeless today and if you think the church doesn't care for you a, a bit, remember this, Jesus died for the ungodly and there's hope for every person. Amen. And that's why Jesus said, what did he say? Let these men go. He'll let you go too. But there is more than forgiveness. There's the joy of knowing the Father, a new relationship, the joy of knowing the king's household. I'm going to read you a dream. Now, this is a literary device. This was written by an author who lived a long, long, long time ago in England. He was a preacher. And he was talking about Jesus and how Jesus saves. In my third dream, I saw a young man who was a university student. He was seated alone in his own small room with his books on the table before him. He was of magnificent physique, but he was very lonely and his heart was disconsolate. There was almost a haunted look on his face. And as I looked into his mind, I saw it was in a state of war. The good was fighting the evil, and the issue was still uncertain. His room was covered, was a symbol of the state of his mind. The walls were covered with vulgar pictures cut from cheap magazines. And yet on a little shelf away in a corner was a photograph of his mother. I do not remember that I heard the door open in my dream. I became aware that Jesus was sitting opposite the student in his bare little room. The knowledge came to me as one becomes aware of the light of some lovely dawn amid the baleful glittering lights of some belated orgy. You thought of me, said the quiet voice, which I've learned in my dreams to love, and so I'm here. I also knew that Jesus could see the battle that was raging in the young man's mind. I knew the fiery temptations of youth, the rash, impetuousness, the desire to see life, were battling with an ideal of a clean, manly life. And the look in Jesus' face made me think of those words. Jesus, looking upon him, loved him. Then there came to me a strange impression. It seemed as though there emanated from Jesus a spirit of belief in the possibilities of the man before him. And he held up his head at once. Indeed, any man may well hold up his head if Jesus believes in him. And although no question had been asked, the student said very quietly, I will begin again. And Jesus smiled. That is another strange thing about Jesus. He has the power to see below the surface into the very depths of the heart. He sees the seeds of lovely flowers where others see only the ugly brown soil that hides them. It is not so true to say that he loves the unlovable as to say that in everyone he sees something lovable. And when the students saw that Jesus believed in him, he believed in himself and goodness sprang into quickened growth. Feeling that Jesus was near, 
as never before. There flashed in the student's mind and an impetuous wish to ask him about some of the intellectual religious difficulties that were troubling him. And Jesus, reading his thoughts, said, Have you not seen enough? And with a great light on his face, the student said, Yes, it is enough. He felt that he wanted no proof. The student felt quite sure of Jesus. And indeed, Jesus needs no credentials except himself. And again in my dream, I was allowed to look into the future. And I saw the student in the same room. But all the vulgar pictures had been taken down. I remember noticing, too, that the sunlight was pouring in through the window. And when I looked into his mind, I saw that there, too, many thought pictures had disappeared. That there, too, the sun was shining. So there's more, I tell you then forgiveness. There is the power of the transforming presence of the living Christ. Amen.